Hi, well, it's great to be here. Um, we're super excited. We're a little jet lagged. And of course, just like we hoped would happen, I'm already thinking, right, we could have thought of that. We could have done it this way. Um, so it's been really great just to see even, you know, the first couple of uh, inspiring presentations. You know, I'm really excited to be here. We are uh, an art centre that was founded 12 years ago. And so I don't know if we're the youngest gang in the room, but it's really exciting to be in contact with centres that have been up and running for, you know, significantly longer. Um, I'm super excited to be able to connect with all of you while we're here. And, you know, we have uh, some colleagues from our country that are with us today as well. And we've been meeting with Indefinite Arts every other year or so for a number of years. And every time we get together, I know both groups come away richer than when we, you know, richer than before. So I'm hoping to see the same thing happen again. I might need a little help making it play. I don't know that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Well, I'll try not to uh, belabor the the obvious. Oh, great. Um, so, like I said, we're 12 years old. We started with uh, one artist and myself, and now we are about 170 people strong, which is a lot of people for a space that feels like about a third the size of, of the space we're in today. And we do a, you know, a lot of different things there. Um, obviously, we're working with the same kinds of people you all are working with, and um, we really think it's exciting to try to reach out, like you guys have already talked about, into other parts of the community. So not only do we support um, these artists with developmental disabilities, we also have some people with addiction issues that we support once a week. And because we're in a very sort of inner city neighborhood, we also like to uh, try to just make friends where we live. So we have a free family art night that we've run, in, run every week for the last 10 years a free community art night that we offer. Those are very important in, in terms of connecting to the rest of our community. <clears throat> so it's a place where you can come, you can become an artist. But you know, one of the ways I think about it a lot, and I'm sure you guys would um, agree, it's also a place where a person who before they met us, who may have had a story inside themselves that was essentially a disability-driven story, if you ask them who they are, often what you'll hear is, you know, the story of the disability and the group home and those kinds of connections. I really love to think about how what we're doing often is we're helping people learn a new story about themselves, develop a new narrative about who they are, so that, you know, hearing you guys talk about what you do as artists, you know, Paul, and like, I just thought that was wonderful. So I'm already thinking that, uh, about how we could do things differently. So we work in a wide variety of media. We have, of course, drawing and painting. But we have uh, printmaking as well. Our friends from Calgary inspired us to do some glass, so we brought glass into our studios a couple of years ago. Um, we support, you know, Edmonton and its surrounding community. And some of our artists come one day a week, some are coming five days a week. We really try to treat it like you should use us the way it works for you. No one's ever been kicked out of the Nina Haggerty Center unless they just wouldn't make anything. You know, if you're really just coming because it's not the mall and it's not the library, it doesn't tend to work for you. But if you're coming and you're inspired and you're driven to make your work, then um, that's what's really important to us. And we have a kind of guiding philosophy, which I would imagine is also shared that, which is that, you know, I don't necessarily have to like the work. That's not very important. What's important is that the people who are making it feel that what they're doing matters. And then, you know, we get the pleasure of seeing People change their own story, families change their stories around what people are, who people are, and what they can do. And we do a fair amount of collaboration, and of course I'm inspired to do more after hearing the previous talk. So this is my colleague Dave, and one of our artists, he's around, oh, he's filming right there. And uh, we do try to be open to the full, you know, full spectrum. We have people who come with very limited motor capabilities, who are sort of very obviously disabled, all the way to 
people who you wouldn't necessarily know. And this is uh, an artist who I'm going to talk about more. I was very hopeful that it would come, but I guess the travel was too intimidating. So, I, you know, I was surprised that when we got the opportunity to join you all here, I thought, okay, how are we going to get this money? The money is going to be an impossibility, and, and it will be so easy to get artists. We actually found the inverse to be true. We got the money relatively quickly. Within three weeks, we had the whole trip funded. And man, we had a hard time getting artists to say yes. I was really, really surprised at how hard it was. I think if we'd said Disneyland, it would have been a different story, <laughs> right? But I don't know. I, I was really, I was very surprised to see how difficult it was to get families to say yes. And so I'm very thrilled to have the people that we brought with us today. Um, we also did some things after, you know, after meeting with people in San Francisco, a few lights came on in my head, and one of the ambitions I set for us was to be doing more external and kind of contemporary practice. So I heard it expressed well by Sue, this idea that we're there to advocate for the inclusion in contemporary practice. So we got a, a really great opportunity last year um, there's a new, well, a sort of a defunct exhibition space in our city that was a temporary home for the big gallery, the Art Gal of Alberta. Well, as it was being rebuilt, they had a temporary space and then it was just sort of laying fallow. And some other people picked it up and they, they sent out a call for proposals with, a, I think, a two-week deadline. And so we, we applied, you know, we applied very quickly and then we got a yes. And again, it was like, well, you've got 14 days to get your show ready. And, and we'll open it. So we really scrabbled, but sometimes those um, short timelines are an advantage, right? We just got to move, just got to get things to happen. So we did this exhibition at um, Enterprise Square Galleries, and we just put up the work from the collective that we support and the staff that we employ. We sprayed it across about 3,500 square feet of exhibition space. We didn't identify, of course, who's who except by name. And I was really gratified by the kind of response we got. You know, we were sort of picked up by the media a little bit, and it was talked about as like this really exciting thing where it sort of didn't matter who was who. It was just stuff that people liked and people made. And so we're old enough now to have some people who can do a solo exhibition. You know, for a number of years it was group shows all the time. But now we have some people who can do their own work. And Desiree is somebody who I've known for a long time. I think of her as a as a friend, really. I've supported her as an artist since long before the Nina Hegarty Center existed. And so for me, this was a big deal. You know, doing this show with Desiree was a significant moment. She's somebody who, to be very frank, is not well liked most of the time. She makes a lot of more enemies than she makes friends. And the studio there was some like, Paul, do we have to have her here? And I just said, we're not here for the easy people, we're here for the artists, right? So, you know, like we're gonna work with her. And I just, I really believed in her. Like I knew who she was. And I knew we'd get over that sort of difficult hump with her. And you know, my favorite story is when I worked with her at the Art Gallery of Alberta, I'd piss her off, you know? She, I'd say, you gotta keep working. And she'd just get mad and she'd leave. She'd go upstairs and as every person entered the gallery, she'd say, hey, do you know who Paul Freeman is? <laughs> that guy's a real asshole. <laughs> but those are her endearing qualities, I think. So <laughs> she had this show last year, which we were really proud of. And she sold the work and, you know, her family and her friends came. It was this really great kind of cumulative moment. I mean, I just love the stuff she makes as well. And Leona Clausen, who's with us on the trip, she had her full, first solo uh, in 2014 as well. We called it Fifty Shades of Brown because we're just kind of cheeky. And she just, she loves brown, you know, and she's like, Paul, what color? Maybe brown. And so it was kind of an in-studio joke for a long time. And she's somebody who works through a, a you know, pretty wide range of media. She's tried, I think, really everything we're doing in the studios, except maybe the digital work, and so she works in print, she works in clay, textiles, her weaving is had, hanging downstairs, and she's been part of some of our significant projects. She was part of our Through the Eyes of Artists project, which was sort of our first big project. Yvonne, who's here with us, made a film about that. We published a book, which I believe we brought with us. You can see copies of it later. This is Leona talking to a guy named John Ralston Saul. He's a fairly well-known writer. He was husband of the Governor General 
in Canada, Adrian Clarkson. So we we just sort of called him up cold and say we're doing said we're doing this book. Do you think he could write a foreword for us? So he generously did some writing and then came to Edmonton a couple times to visit the studio. So that was really those were great moments for us. And for me, it's that I mean, all of it's important, but I love those times like this when we can all get together, get the work up, share with each other what's been going on. Some of our artists have had the opportunity to travel before. They've been to Toronto, to Vancouver, um, but mostly it's been within, you know, within our country. So it's exciting to have our first international trip. This fellow is no longer with us, unfortunately. He died a few years ago, but he was one of our absolutely favorite artists. And he's holding up his Jane Cameron Award, which is something that the people at Indefinite Arts administer. So he won that award one year. It's an annual competition for artists with Down syndrome in Canada. They submit work, and he was very fortunate to be chosen one year. Uli Rossier is, has some work in our show downstairs. It's that very colorful, tightly drawn stuff. And uh, again, she's an artist that I knew before we started Dinah, and is somebody who I think of as being important to us. Here's Yvonne Sun Felix being interviewed, talking about the work he did for our first big book. And here he is in Ottawa meeting the, you know, the important politicians with Leona. So we also, you know, try to provide some other opportunities. We've been working hard to connect with youth and adults with, art, with autism. And Yvette, somebody who works in our studios and then does a lot of sort of volunteering and facilitating with people. Paul's maybe on hiatus right now, but for a while he did a lot of sort of the public stuff with me. We'd go out and run print, printmaking workshops in schools or with other groups. He's somebody who really loves to show off, so that's been good. And we have uh, an exhibition venue at our place. We really try to use it as a space where outsiders can show, whatever that means. I'm, on paper, it just says we show art by artists. But in practice, we try to focus our energy on providing exhibition opportunity to people who don't get that easily. And we are crazy enough to do 19 shows a year in that space. So we, like I'm sure most of you, we have a hard time saying no. We also have a hard time hearing it. So, you know, we, we tend to, if somebody looks like they need it and they really will find a way to elbow them in some room. And so here's a couple pics from those free community and family art nights, which have been an important part of our life. And it does bring that, you know, sometimes a teacher comes and she says, hey, could I bring my kids to see what you're doing? So that's how this group of elementary school kids arrived at our place. And we support um, a city center education project every year. So Scott Berry, who I really wanted to come couldn't get it to happen. We were close. We were close to getting him here, but we just wrapped up a great big project with him. We were very fortunate to get a grant from our City Arts Council. Last year we got $15,000 basically by promising to do something. The application was about as vague as I've ever written, and it really just said we know we want to do a, an installation project. We had previously done a puppet-based project which sort of organically grew out of people making puppets, discovering one of our volunteers was a writer. We just sort of brought all that together. Then we leapfrogged off that onto an animation project, which was also a lot of fun, but both of those projects had this sort of narrative problem. It's hard for anybody to write a good story. It's hard for anybody to, to kind of craft that narrative. So we thought we'd flip it over this time and instead create a space where the viewer might come in and create a narrative. And so. It still had a narrative agenda, but it was just a little bit inverted. And we began this process in a very awful, kind of uncomfortable way, but a deliberately uncomfortable way. We brought a lot of people together to brainstorm up ideas. We discovered through these big group meetings, though, that one of our big challenges was, I don't know if it was the context we'd set up or what it was exactly, but people just seemed to want to say what they thought we wanted to hear. And we found that it just wasn't really clicking, which was okay. We knew it would be hard to figure out what we were going to do. But Scott was somebody who kept saying interesting things. He'd say, well, what if we went into the gallery and we moved backward in time? And we thought, yeah, that sounds hard, but interesting. Well, maybe we could do something like that. And so eventually, partly because time was running out, I said, hey, you know, 
again, maybe we could focus on Scott as a kind of hub for this project. Let's talk to him about what he's doing. Because one of the things we discovered in even talking one-on-one -on -one with people, as soon as we said, what if we invented a world, what kind of characters would be in it, right away we got Donald Duck, Mickey Mouse, you know, sort of the stereotypical things were popping. So we just changed directions and we stopped talking to people. Instead, we built sort of a book, a brand book in a way, of what Scott does and what he's interested in, what are his inspirations, what do his images look like, and we started sharing those with everybody in the studio, letting them respond to what he does, and we all started asking more questions about what he wanted to do and what this room could feel like, and he kept saying this word, confusement. He would like it to feel confusing, he'd like it to be kind of like a fun house, so we spent quite a bit of time talking with him. Here's some of Scott's work. He loves black and white. He's got a real strong kind of comic book thing going on. Don't know why that's empty. This is his first little installation project, which was part of our, whoops, part of our uh, big group show that we did at Enterprise Square Galleries. He's also been doing some book making. And, you know, he's, he told me once that he stole these ideas from me. I was in the studio cutting the heads off sculptures one day, and he said, oh yeah, I like that idea. And so all these trees covered in heads and things like that, he told me one day, no, Paul, I stole that idea from you. Which, you know, of course is what ought to happen. So we, we developed a few basic ideas about what could happen in this room. Scott does, draws a lot of these kind of conjoined figures, these figures that are connected to other figures and have heads in weird places and stuff. So we started replicating all the bodies in the studio. This is Randy, he's here with us uh, this week as well. And so we started copying everybody's body. And I was very deliberate about this. I said, this has, has to happen in the middle of the studio. I want everybody watching it all the time because it's not that comfortable getting wrapped in plastic and tape. Um, but we sort of deliberately created the me next, you know, kind of situation. And so this is Randy getting wrapped. The process is, you know, you wrap somebody in cellophane first, saran wrap, anything non-sticky, and then wrap them again in at least three layers, seven's better, of packing tape. As long as you can get them to take it, you know, as long as they can stand it. And then, of course, this is the most exciting part. Not everybody went here, but a lot of people did. You know, it was really great to see that happen. So, a lot of trust, obviously, in the studio, and then here's Randy with himself, in a way. And these effigies are kind of inspired, well, not kind of, they are inspired by Scott's work. A few years ago, he made a copy of himself. He'd been to a wax museum as a kid, and he said, I just really want to make myself. So we helped him build a sort of plaster bandage figure, which is called Raymond, and he sat in the window of our gift shop for years, scaring passers-by. And yeah, so here are people showing off what they made, love that picture. And uh, we also did these big painting parties. So Scott's, eye, Scott's work is full of eyeballs. We didn't necessarily all know this until we started talk to, talking to him. I just saw circles before, but he told me they were eyeballs. So we started these big kind of painting parties. We spent about maybe seven, eight days in the studio. Of course, if he didn't want to participate, he didn't, but there was a lot of encouragement to do it. And you know, the most exciting thing for me in this process of just bringing everyone together to play. First of all, we started playing again, which, you know, like I'm sure you all recognize, like you get so busy at work, that chance to do what you were doing maybe at the beginning when things were small, when you could play and, and have fun with people, uh, that had kind of left us. So it was a chance to reconnect through making again, which was really exciting. But the other really exciting thing for me was we have some people, not a lot, but some in our studio who they don't innovate easily, or maybe ever. And I don't know why, but it's just a challenge for, for them. But somehow, in this context of we're all painting together and we're all making eyeballs, these people who typically make the same thing every time started to change what they made. It was a really interesting moment for me because it made me think again about how the structure we provide has a big impact on how people work. So, it was an important moment, definitely. And here's Scott standing in his exhibition. But really, it's our exhibition. We all work together on Scott's ideas. Here he is stand, staring at uh, that original plaster figure, which he repainted for this 
exhibition. And he talked a lot about wanting you to feel looked at when you were in the show, wanting to, wanting, not wanting you to feel embarrassed, but wanting you to feel like people were talking about you. So there's this kind of soundtrack of music that people made with the musician that we hired, but also the sound of whispering and talking and just that sense that maybe people were speaking about you rather than, rather than to you. And now I think I can show you, I hope. Yeah, a little walkthrough. So hopefully I can play it for you in a different way. He also did a hand-drawn animation, which is here and also very good. Great exhibition. It was up for eight days. We took it down right before we left. We worked like crazy to build it. <laughs> but it has another life, although it's made out of ridiculous materials, craft paper and packing tape. Uh, it's going to be with the help of a new corporate sponsor, 
going to have some more life. They're going to, Stantec, which is a big international architecture firm based in Edmonton, is going to help us travel this show a little bit, help pay for some shipping. They're going to show it in some of their offices and also help us connect with some other places. So it does, it does have another life. For sure, although, um, and we were, you know, kind of deliberate about saying, look, we can't think about the shipping, and let's, let's just make what we need to make. And it was a lot of fun. We had a, a really great time together. So, that's about it, although I can show you it if you want. It, it's very funny, so I'm going to show it to you. Yeah. Um, if I can see it on the desktop. Scott's hand-drawn movie. Anyway, unlike a lot of hand-drawn animation, Scott drew every picture, like every frame. So the objects boil a little bit. It's kind of a story of a guy who just has, well, you see, the terrible thing. So Scott often talks about wishing he could live on a desert island, like get away from staff, get away from all those normal demands, and that movie kind of does that thing too. Fred finally finds his spot where no one else is. Anyway, thanks a lot for having us here. It's been great to come, and I look forward to talking to you all later.